Mark chapter number 2. Um, I'll be honest with you, this is um, um, the introduction here tonight. When we get to that, it's a little bit different. Um, I really struggled over the introduction uh, just because it is a little bit different on what how God was leading me, but I believe this is where God will have us tonight, and hopefully it'll be a help to each and every one of us here. Mark chapter number 2, and we're going to start reading in verse number 1. And it says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing him one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. When he had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does, this man, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether it is easier, whether is it easier to say unto the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But ye, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the reading of your word. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, to be able to come into your house tonight, Lord. Lord, help us never to take this for granted. Lord, I ask you be with what ask you just be with what you've laid upon my heart. Lord, help me convey it here to your people the way you gave it to me, Lord, it'd be a strength and encouragement and a help to each and every one of us here, Lord. If there be anybody that's lost, Lord, help them see their need for salvation before they leave here tonight, Lord. But help each and every one of us walk out of here tonight closer to you than what we was when we came in. Ask you just help us and meet with us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By way of introduction, I'm really just going to look at two things here a little bit differently um, than, than having a whole little alliterated message or uh, introduction here. But I want to think about two things from this passage of Scripture. The first thing I want to think about is the obstacles that we found here. Uh, we obviously know that these, that these men that brought this one sick of the palsy, they had many obstacles that they encountered along the way. Uh, we know that they couldn't get in the front door because of all the people. Uh, we know that they had that one that was sick of the palsy. Imagine that, Brother Bob, packing somebody by bed. Uh, you know, I think at times we forget that they, they, they wasn't living though like we are. Uh, they wasn't going to throw him in the back of the van somewhere, Brother Ray, and just be able to take him down the road somewhere. Uh, these fellows were carrying him by bed. They were taking him down and trying to get him to Jesus, who they heard was there, so that he could get the help that they knew that he could get. Now think about it. How many obstacles are placed in our life throughout our lives? Uh, how many obstacles, I, I could tell you, and I, you know, how many obstacles obviously were placed in people's way today, and that's why they're not here. I had numerous texts, things that came up, things that happened, and things where people couldn't be here uh, for whatever reason. And I'm sure that I'm, there's no doubt in my mind all those are valid reasons. However, obstacles, when you look up obstacles, it does not say uh, that it should just completely stop something. It just says it should prevent or hinder progress. Not necessarily that it might stop it completely, because it talks about progress. So we should still be able to go around those obstacles at times. You think you might have had at work today, you might have had to work an extra hour, or, or maybe you got behind, or certain things that happened uh, that was an obstacle, but you still were willing to overcome it. Why do we find it so easy to overcome obstacles in our everyday walk, but not overcome obstacles when it comes to the things of God? Why do we get busy and, and our phone ring or, or something happened and all of a sudden we make excuse why we can't study? We make excuse why we can't read. We make excuse why we can't go to work because that small obstacle placed in our way. But yet, well, when it comes time to going to work, hey, I, I got off the exit before at work probably a couple years ago, uh, and B Brother Donald, I pulled off of work, and I immediately heard something, I just heard, Psh! I can hear it all the way inside the truck. Busted a tire, get out, change the tire, and make sure you get to work. What would we do if we was on our way to church and it happened? Well, I'm going to text pastor, pastor, I had a flat tire, I'm not going to make it to church, because my hands might be a little bit dirty for changing the tire or something like that. 
Look, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but it's amazing how small of obstacles sometimes it will take to keep us from the things of God, to keep us from doing certain things. When it comes to everything else in the world, we'll just go right around those obstacles, Brother Phil. We'll work our way around them, do whatever we got to do to make sure we get uh, uh, to wherever we need to go. I was talking to Miss Mary and Miss Marcy over there earlier, and we were talking about how cold it was. I ain't cold anymore. I'm finally either, either finally nervous enough or whatever it may be, but I ain't cold anymore. Uh, so we see the obstacles. Not only do we see the obstacles there uh, in the reading of this story, but we also can look at, at the worship that was going on. And there's a lot of worship that we can see. We obviously know the, uh, so many people that were there to hear Jesus teach, uh, hear Jesus preach to them. Uh, we know there's no doubt that this man who you would think that his sins were forgiven and God told, and Jesus told him to take up his bed, uh, no doubt he probably did a little worshiping on his own as well uh, at the feeling. And when you look up worship, the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. So when you talk about showing reverence to something, talk about showing reverence to God, we seem to have it, I'm afraid, sometimes in our mind and look at worship as a certain uh, way that you have to do things. Can I say that isn't a certain, there's no certain way for each and every one of us individually to worship. Me and Brother Phil was talking before service, and he talked about uh, he just liked to come here preaching and just liked to be able to come and worship God. You might not worship the same way Brother Phil does. You might not be willing to raise your hand and shout and, and, and maybe run laps around the church building. Your worship might be a tear or two coming down your face. Your worship might be you're just willing to just raise your hand and just praise God a little bit. But we all have different kinds of worship that we can have. It, and, and it doesn't matter, and this is where I'm afraid that, that you, know, you might not agree, and that's fine, you don't have to agree. You can be wrong if you'd like to be. But they're assuming that was terrible, wasn't it? But I'm afraid so many times we come into church and we think if it's not a, a, a uplifting message and we're not throwing babies and swinging from the chandeliers and all that, we can't really worship. Well, why not? Why not if we come in and our pastor gets up and he's preaching to us somewhere where we're at in sin and he's stepping on our toes, why can't we count it worship to be able to come into an old-fashioned altar and thank God that he loves us enough to point out the things that where we're wrong and to point out the things that we need to do to get closer to him and ask God to forgive us and get those things right. And then we go back out of here and be able to do something for him. There's all kinds of worship. There's all kinds of obstacles. So what I want to preach on this morning, what God gave me, and hopefully to be a help to us, what obstacle is stopping your worship? What obstacles are stopping you from worshiping? When you come into church, like I just said, it doesn't matter what we come in, it doesn't matter what message we may hear. I, I believe with all my heart that if you come seeking God, our pastor or whoever's preaching could get up here and preach John 3, 16 and preach a strictly salvation message from the very first uh, uh, th verse that's read to the very end of it, and you can still get something from it if you come seeking Him. Now, if you're just going to come out of obligation or come out of just because, hey, it's Sunday or Wednesday and that's what I do, you might not get anything if you've not put the time in. But if you come seeking something, I truly believe you will get something. But what obstacles are preventing us from worshiping? Why do we see so many people come in so many times and leave back out the same way and never see a change? Why do we see so many people that could come in and you never see them shed a tear, never raise a hand, you'll never see them at the altar, you never see them want to truly just and, and just express what God's done for them when it comes time for uh, uh, um, testimonies that you just never see them. What obstacles are stopping us from worship? And the first one, and, and look, God gave me this over a week ago. You can look back at the notes when I started this. It has nothing to do with what's going on tonight or anything of that nature. But can I say, first thing, too many times the obstacle that prevents our worship is the speaker. You know, somebody shared this here a, a, a while back, Brother Donald, and I seen this and thought it was funny, and I might allude to it after a while. I wasn't going to allude to it unless God put it back in my mind here. And this lady, I guess she does some kind of funny tips, top ten tips, Brother Ed. I don't know what she does. And she did one that was talking about church. And it's going through, and one of the things was, you know, make sure you eat before you come to church. Your stomach's going to let you know. Uh, make sure you stop at the, at the gas station and break that $50 because we're going to take up our tithe and offering. We're going to take up for the building fund, and we're going to take up for this. And, and if you're going to want to give to everything, you're going to have to break that 50 because we ain't going to make change for you. And she got to the very last one, Brother Donald. I thought it was funny. If the assistant's preaching, we ain't going to be there. 
Well, you just look around and, and you can. But how many times does a speaker an obstacle to our worship? There's no doubt there are plenty of very valid reasons for those who might not be here tonight. There are very valid reasons for those who might not come if Brother Doug told you somebody else was going to be here. Sure. Would they be here if he told you Brother Mike was coming? Or Brother Cody was going to come up? Or Brother whoever, Brother Sidney Weaver was going to be here tonight? Because that speaker thing and affecting our worship, in my opinion, can be good or bad. Right. You should not be showing up just because a certain person is or is not going to be standing here behind this pulpit preaching. Doesn't matter who it is, how good they are, how bad they are, that is not the reason for us to come to be focused on the speaker. Can I say the speaker, no doubt, was what uh, was an obstacle that they had here getting this man um, in to be able to see him get healed. They knew Jesus was coming because why? It tells us in verse number 1. And he again he entered into Capernaum after some days and it was noise that he was in the house. So no doubt that they have heard some of the things that Jesus has done. They've heard how he has healed people. They've heard some of the things that, uh, the help they can get. So everybody ran to hear what Jesus had to say. Why, 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 why are we not full tonight? Regardless of the fact of who, what members might be here, why have we not done a good job of noising about of what Jesus can do for those that we don't see lost people here tonight? Why are we not doing a better job of noising about them what Jesus has done in our life so that we don't see a packed house here? Why is it we could pull in and find plenty, plenty of parking spots here tonight uh, instead of being able to come in and just hear from Jesus? The speaker should not be something that is an obstacle to our worship, good or bad. But too many times we are focused on, hey, we can't wait for camp meeting. I hear Brother Sidney's coming, or hear this preacher's coming, or that preacher's coming. Well, I'm just looking to come to camp meeting, just see God show up and do something great. I want to see it turn into a week meeting or a two-week meeting. I remember in the old building some of those meetings that would go on for two and three weeks, not just three or four days and be done. Because we get too focused on speakers anymore. We get too focused on who's going to be singing, or who's going to be preaching, or who's going to be uh, bringing the message, so to speak, or whatever it may be, instead of focused on what the content is in that meeting. Because I can say, first off, the first thing is obstacle too many times our worship is the speaker. And I say the second time is the, the second thing that can be an obstacle that we see here to our worship. Obviously, what, what we know this portion of Scripture to be mostly about is just the sickness that we see in verse number 3. And they came unto him, bringing to him one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now, there, there are some of you sitting here on the front row that you do not understand this, of what I'm about to say. But, Brother Peter, you might understand a little more what I'm going to say. How many days of you, and I know some of you are going to look at me and laugh when I say this, but how many of you, maybe my age, maybe a little older, you never feel good. You never feel good. You wake up every day and you hurt. You know, I, I, I went downstairs, Brother Ray, Brother Ray, I've talked to Brother Ray, he knows I have an inversion table, and I went downstairs and hung upside down the other night, and I told Tina, I was like, this, is a this isn't my neck, it's a different spot. It's a different spot that hurts, that just constantly hurts anymore. We all hurt all the time. But how many times does our sickness hinder us and keep us as an obstacle from worshiping? We come in and, well, I just don't feel good. I'm coming to church tonight because that's just what I'm supposed to do. I'm just going to sit here. Phew, I hope God gives us something. What kind of attitude's that? Right. What kind of attitude's that? God woke us up today. That should give us enough that, God, that we are able to be here. Yes, we might not feel good. Yes, we might hurt. Yes, it might be a struggle to get here, but praise God, we are here. Right. Can I say, it, it may, and I, I don't want to... Um, God put it in my mind. You have two ladies that are here tonight that Miss Sister Barb just walked in and Sister Lynn is here that, that, that come in using walkers that no doubt the pain and everything that they're going through, yet they're here. But then we have some of us that are able-bodied and we walk in on two feet and don't have any kind of serious health issues and we kind of, oh, my head hurts and my arm hurts and this hurts and I just, you know, I'm here though. What kind of attitude is that? The sickness that was, had the opportunity here to be an obstacle to them from worshiping. This man couldn't go unless somebody was going to take him. Think of the sickness like that. Imagine being so bad off that you couldn't even get anywhere unless somebody else was willing to take you. And that's what it was. Our sickness sometimes can be an obstacle to our worship. Can I say this? This is one of the things that lady that I alluded to. This was one of the other things in her top ten list. Um, Brother Jen that she said, she goes... There's not assigned seats, but there's assigned seats. 
And how many times does the seat affect our worship? How many times have you walked in that back door and you look in, somebody's in my seat. What are they doing in my seat? And then we walk in there, and then you, you see, look, I, I say this because I've done this. And then you start looking around. Well, now, where am I going to sit at? Who would I want to sit by? Who's going to like me sitting by? I mean, you start looking around. Well, I, I can't, that Miss Lisa sits over there. She'll come out of Sunday school in a minute. She's going to sit there. And Brother Bob and Sonny sit there. And all of a sudden, then we finally sat down, and we sat there the whole time. I can't believe those, those visitors come in and took my seat. Why didn't somebody tell them? Brother, Brother Ed and Miss Kay sat behind me. They know that's where I sat. Why didn't they tell them, hey, Brother Josh and Miss Tina sat there? Why didn't they let them know that was our seat? How many times does our seat affect our worship? How many times do we come in and we're too worried about that's why I, That's why I appreciate Brother Phil. You never know where Brother Phil's going to sit. He's back there. He'll be over there on Sunday. He'll be over there next Wednesday. I don't know. He don't sit over here very much. Do you not like them over here, Brother Phil? Is it just something about that section? And look, and, and, and me and Miss Tina back during when we had revival meeting and, and the, um, oh my, the Lancaster family, every time they come in, they sit in our pew because Brother Peter and Miss Dawn let them sit there. They never tell them. And so we had to move around that week. So I, I already bring Brother Ed and Miss Kay. So I had to get somebody else. And, and so we moved around. And there is a difference. I will tell you, there is a difference on where you sit. Your, your angle to the pulpit and when you see and the different in the sound. So I get it, all those things. But that shouldn't affect our worship. I shouldn't have to come in and sit over here and think, well, it's just not the same as sitting in the middle. Now I can't see everything is good, or, and the sound's different, and it's, it's five degrees hotter over here, and I wish I was over there, and it's colder over there. And we allow those crazy things to play in our mind. And, and you, can, you can lie to yourself and say it doesn't make a difference. Let somebody sit in your seat come up Sunday and see what happens. Let somebody see it, be in your seat when you walk in Sunday morning and see what happens. See how it affects your attitude. Be honest with yourself and see how it truly affects your attitude throughout the rest, throughout the rest of the morning. Can I say this, fourthly? The simple things that too many times are obstacles to our worship. When we come in, these fellas wasn't going to let anything stop them. Imagine taking this man, and you've done walked all this way. And we could, we could say, well, hey, they walked all that way. They wasn't going to let anything stop them. Right. But you walk, and you walk up to, the, to the, the, the synagogue there, wherever they was at, and all of a sudden you look around, and it's like, it's full. We can't get in. Sorry, buddy, we tried. Maybe if he comes back here again in a week or two, we'll try again and turn around and go home. Too many times there's just simple things. And to me, that's not necessarily to say a simple thing. But it's those simple things that get in our way that keep us from being willing to worship. We, we, you go to, to work on a Wednesday, and, and one of your coworkers makes you mad, and you just stew on that all day, and you come in, and you're sitting here, and you're listening to preaching, you're listening to singing, and think, man, I can't, I can't believe John did that to me today. That just makes me so mad. What's that got to do with worship right now? What's that got to do with anything that's going on? I asked Brother Doug, he said he had some things that he was going to share, so I didn't I asked, I asked him this today. He had shared this with me. I asked him if I could share it. So uh, most of you know, if you know Brother Jeremy Scott, I believe he's been here two or three, I know at least twice. I think two or three times he's been here. The last time he was here was when he was talking about he was trying to raise money to be able to order a van. That his van that he had had a bunch of miles on it and driving around down there, and he was trying to get a van and raise money for that. Well, praise be to God, he got the money for it evidently, and he ordered that van eight months ago. And that van still isn't there. Um, they, they said they, I guess last time they had told him it should be there sometime in April or May. And uh, our pastor said that he's been going every Monday. I'm guessing that's probably when the boats come in and check the boats and all those kind of things for it. And he said he was down, as I alluded to a while ago, he's down, you know, last Monday in May will be this upcoming Monday. So hope he'll get it. I don't know what kind of van he has right now, Brother Donald. But that van he has right now, Brother Doug said, has over 400,000 miles on it. And he's still going out and picking up people. And he said, based on their roads, he said it'd probably be about 800,000 miles. He said, because their roads are atrocious. He said, he goes out and will pick up 19 people to put in this van to bring him to church. And he said, his van is smaller than Caitlin's. So if you don't know what van Caitlin has, Caitlin has our old Honda Odyssey. So take a van smaller than your little Honda Odyssey or your Toyota Sienna or anything like that. And he's picking up 19 people to take him to church. So what's our excuse? What's our excuse? 
He's coming and picking up people and taking them to church that they are excited to be there. I've seen a couple of videos, one of them under the tent from last week, excited to be there. You see God having is moving. Uh, by all accounts, they have saved 33 people so far, and God doing a great work down there, and yet we're sweating the simple things up here. Well, gas went up again today, 20 cents, and we're sitting here worried about and mad ourselves because I didn't get gas yesterday, and now it's 20 cents higher. Well, go, go get you a Costco membership or a Sam's membership. It's about 50 cents cheaper there right now. I say that's one thing. If you, don't, if you don't know the key or the little secret to having Costco and Sam's membership, that is something I noticed. When gas gets, it seems like it's above 350, they're way cheaper. When it gets below about 325, they're about the same as everybody else. I don't understand the difference. That's just the way it is. But we sweat the simple things. We come into church and we get so worried about just things that doesn't matter, things that in the grand scheme of things aren't important and don't really take us anywhere or have to do anything, and it affects us and keeps us from coming in and truly worshiping Him. Where is it that, that I, what happened to our peace that we can have out of Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 7? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Why is it that we come in and struggle so much with that peace that we can't worship? Why is that we have something happen out there and we drag it in here with us on Sundays or we drag it in here with us on Wednesdays and it keeps us from worshiping God the way we should. It keeps us from worshiping God the way we could because we're sweating the simple stuff. We're sweating the things that in the grand scheme of things don't matter. I'm not talking about important stuff. I'm talking about things that don't truly matter. Can I say this fifthly? I'm glad I have a lot of points. <clears throat> could it be strife? Look in verse number 3. And they came to him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So you got these four fellows that are packing this one that is sick. Can I say if one of them had strife with one another, that wasn't going to work. I don't know if you've ever tried to just carry anything heavy any place, just two of you. If you're not both going at the same time, it's not going to happen. So why is it that we think we could come in here and have worship, and we could come in here and worship if I'm sitting here constantly thinking, well, I can't believe Brother Clint sang that song. I just don't like Brother Clint. I don't like his singing. don't like his guitar playing. How can we do that if, we ha if that strife can keep us from worship? If we're too focused on somebody else that's sitting in here, you know, if we're too focused on, I, I wish Brother Phil would be quiet. He shouts too loud. I, I'm not going to make sure I don't sit beside him. We'll get a different seat. We already talked about that one. But too many times strife is keeping us from worshiping, and it's an obstacle in our worship because we're too worried about somebody else. Can I say, <clears throat> in Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 1, it says, Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than the house full of sacrifices with strife. Romans 13, 13, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife, and envying. And this is the verse, well, hopefully, we probably all know in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. We come in, we're so focused on somebody else and something we don't like about them or something they did or something they, uh, uh, that whatever it may be, that it keeps us from worshiping. Can I say this sixthly? I only got two more. Hang in there with me just for a little bit longer. Verse number 4, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Can I say they was willing to go above and beyond to do whatever they could to get their, you would assume their friend here, to Jesus to see him get healed. Is our service an obstacle to our worship? Is our service an obstacle to our worship? Do we do so much around the church house or so much in the church house that when we get here, we're so focused on that that it keeps us from worshiping? Do we get so worried about coming in here and, like, I, 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 like, I, I don't want to, to, to try to, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this now, I've just popped in my head. Do we get so worried about we come in here and we see, you know, we, we pull in and, and hopefully Brother Ray don't do this. I, I think it, I try to tell him all the time how great the yard looks. And I don't tell Miss Tammy enough how great the flowers and everything look. If, if you've not walked through here and think how beautiful everything is, you, you need, you're worried about too many of the simple things as you walk into anything else. Our grounds are beautiful. They are, they're, they're meticulously kept and just look beautiful. But hopefully they don't walk in here and think, oh, there, there's a weed. I hope nobody's seen that weed. It was people who clean walk in here and think, there's somebody just dropped a paper on the floor, and I just swept that yesterday. I get that. But don't sweat that. 
Don't allow that service to hinder you from worship. Don't allow that service that you're sitting in here thinking about, boy, i got so much stuff to do this weekend and, and all this and all that. Don't let it affect your worship while you're in here. We get so wrapped up on doing certain things, we allow it to affect our worship. We all know the verse, Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We, we, it is very easy to get that weary in well-doing. We get to where we just want to do as much as we can, and as much as we can, we become so focused on that, we forget to worship Him. We get so focused on all the things that we got going on, we forget to just come in and worship. We forget to just come in and just spend time with God, whether it be getting right or whether it be just thanking Him for everything He's done for us, whatever it may be, but just spending that time worshiping Him. Don't allow that service to get you uh, become an obstacle to worship. Now, let me say this lastly. We see verses number 6 through 8. Keep in mind that this house, as it talks about, when he entered into Capernaum, and back in verse number 1, it was noise that he was in the house. And we know that there were so many people in there that they couldn't even get and bring this man in. We know the whole story. And now he tells this one sick of the palsy in verse number 5, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiving thee. And this is, can, can I say this as a side note? These next three verses are something that I think, Brother Donald, we really, really struggle getting hold of. And here's the reason why. This isn't the only place this happens. There is other places in Scripture where it talks about Jesus perceived what they said in their hearts. He sees what's in our heart. You can sit there and think about me or think about somebody else or do whatever you want to do and think, hey, it's all good because I didn't say it out loud, Brother Bob. The Lord still knows. The Lord still says, and in each of these occasions, he calls them out. What do we think would happen? You, you know, you watch all those old good cartoons and those kind of things, and you've seen the little blur pop up, and they had the little thought bubble or whatever above their head. Boy, would that be scary if we just started putting thought bubbles up above everybody's head right now of what's going on. I'm just saying, because he tells them in verse number 6, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can, forget, who can forgive sins but God only? And in verse number 8, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? He looked on their hearts and knew what was going on inside their head. He knew what was going on inside their mind. He is calling them out for something that they don't think anybody has an idea. So the last thing. What is an obstacle to your worship? Is it our spirituality? Revelation chapter number 3. We all know the church of Laodicea, verses 15 through 17. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Is our spirituality a hindrance or an obstacle to our worship? Because how easy is it for us to come in here tonight and sit and think, where's so-and-so at? Why aren't they here? I'm here tonight. I came to hear Brother Josh preach. I appreciate that. From the bottom of my heart, I appreciate that. That's not the attitude we should have. Where's so-and-so at? I bet so-and-so ain't going to be here come this weekend or next weekend or whatever. I appreciate that. But that has nothing to do with what we need to be focused on right here. Because when we get to doing that, Brother Phil, we start to have, try to make ourselves be sound and be a little more spiritual than what we truly are. We begin to point fingers because we think that makes it easy and that makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves. We can think of the public and stand in there saying, I'm glad I'm not like him, that I do this and I do that and I do this and therefore, ha ha, look at me. Look, our pastor has talked about, uh, we've never had any of these problems here, thank the Lord, but our pastor has talked about churches gone by and people will give so much money for, for pews or whatever it may be, and all of a sudden they think that they own the church or they be able, should be able to call the shots on certain things. Well, that's hogwash. Why'd you give it for? But too many times, I believe it's our spirituality that is affecting our worship. Because we come in, we think we are saved, we think that we are good, I'm going to heaven, I'm on my way to heaven, I'm done with all the nonsense that's going on in this world, I mean, I, I can't even shop at Target anymore, and all these kinds of things, and, and all this stuff going on, and we think, I'm just glad I'm not like that. 
And we come in here because, see, I'm at church on a Wednesday night when everybody else I know out there that I work with, all of them are out probably getting half drunk or they're out doing this or out doing that. And here I sit in church where I'm supposed to be. Look how wonderful I am. That's probably no different than what those scribes are sitting there. That if Jesus could look at us and say, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Because too many times our spirituality is an obstacle to our worship because we think we are better than what we truly are. We get so caught up in ourselves by looking around at everyone else. We want to be able to point fingers and say, well, this, this person over here, this denomination over here, and I got this right, and I got that right, and I'm in good shape. No, that tells me right there how poor and wretched and miserable we are and how much we truly need God. What are obstacles to your worship? What is it that keeps you from coming in and worshiping? I understand completely that not every message that our pastor that God gives him might not be coming in, like I said earlier, and throwing babies and swinging from the chandeliers. But we should all be able to get something. I don't understand coming in. This is just me. This is, I, I could be way off base on this. I could be completely wrong on this, okay? But I can't understand coming in setting down in church and just sitting here if you're coming in on Sunday morning you're sitting here for two two and a half hours or an hour hour and a half on Sunday night or an hour hour and a half on Wednesday night 45 minutes if I'm preaching and I just can't imagine sitting here just like this yeah. well that was good let's go home yeah. Amen. where's the worship in that yeah. but so many times we seem to come in and that's it yeah. we and I could be wrong I can remember, and Brother Doug just brought it up at the, uh, the, during the uh, baptismal service on Sunday night, I remember one service recently where we just came in and God just showed up. We came in and God just showed up. You know what God did? God saved somebody that service. Why don't we have more of those? Because I'm afraid too many of these obstacles affect us from the time we walk through that door. We don't come in looking to worship. We come in looking to find Brother Peter so I can complain about something. I look to come in and find Brother Randy so I can complain about something. I look to come in and tell Brother, uh, 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 Brother Donald all my problems throughout the day. I look to come in and, and talk to, uh, complain about the NBA to Sydney or whatever it may be, that we come in looking for everything else as opposed to coming in looking to worship. What if we truly got rid of all those obstacles at that door and we walked in here each and every time ready to worship, asking God to do something for us? Our, our pastor might get up and he might have the message that skins our hide and steps on our toes, even though I would say we don't get those very often. But that might be what it is. You know, we can praise God and thank God that he loves us enough to make sure we got right. right. How often do we come in ready to worship? What are the obstacles that are in our way? We see many obstacles, but they did not let it stop them. Those four fellows carrying that one stick of the palsy, they did not let it stop them from coming in and doing what they wanted to do and coming in and worshiping. Why do we let certain things stop us? Brother Clint asked you just come get your guitar and play something. We'll invite you to come. Maybe you can come and just ask God what obstacle it is maybe that's in your way. What obstacle do you need to get rid of and ask God to be able to worship? Like I said, I just don't understand coming and just sitting like a knot on the log and not being willing to raise her hand, not being able to do anything to worship him. Let's pray while he's picking out a song. Our grace, Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the message you've laid upon my heart. Lord, we just ask you to speak to hearts during this invitation. Lord, Lord, help us that we come each and every time looking to worship you, Lord. Lord, you've been so good to us. Lord, you've been so wonderful to us. There's so many things that you've done for us, Lord, where you've brought even just our church from, Lord. There's so many of us could sit here and say the things that you've done in our life, Lord of how you've met with us and how you've saved us and saved family. Lord, to help us to be able to be willing to come in here and ready to worship you each time, Lord, as you speak to hearts during this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.